The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. As an incentive to encourage them to tackle the sermon, I offered to take a little share of the load by speaking briefly on the lessons for today, and then encourage them to offer up a personal perspective on faith by sharing a little bit about their journey and beliefs. I must admit that when I saw the Gospel for today included John 3.16, I let out a little groan. In the last few decades, this verse has permeated the pop and sports cultures in the United States and has stood as a beacon of evangelism uh, that you can't really escape from. And for good reason. It very neatly summarizes the narrative of the Gospel's message into one tightly packed sentence. And when you only have a moment to catch someone's attention, it's a great go-to. At this point, however, I wonder about its impact as it has been so widely used, and I'd be curious about how many people actually bother to take notice. Imagine my delight, then, when I realized that the text started at the beginning of the third chapter of John with one of my biblical heroes, Nicodemus. He is not one of the major, major players and doesn't necessarily come off as having it all together, but I think that's actually a big part of why I've always held a special place in my heart for him. In fact, when prompted to name my newly acquired laptop during the registration process, I actually went straight for Nicodemus, which may out me as a bit of a mild Bible dork, but um, as someone for whom me sticks out as a patron saint of sorts for questioning, understanding, and seeking the truth, I thought it an appropriate match. Our story begins with a previously unmentioned man named Nicodemus who sneaks out to where Jesus is, under the cover of night, to meet with him in secret. As a Pharisee and a member of the ruling, Jew, of the ruling member of the Jewish council, we are to assume here that Nicodemus knows the rules and expectations of his culture. And at first we might have an instinct to judge him for being ashamed or being a coward to be seen with Jesus in public and just going along with the societal pressures put upon him by his fellow evil Pharisees. But I suspect that at the heart of this evening rendezvous, there is something a lot more innocent. The imagery that is conjured up in this section of John is enough to, perhaps, uh, bring about great feelings of nostalgia of summer nights and mildly rebellious youth. Now, if you were a youth or are a youth who broke a curfew or snuck out from time to time, I'm assuming that the purpose was perhaps not as pure as to seek out uh, questions of faith and the validity of Jesus as the true Son of God, but maybe I'm assuming too much, I don't know. The idea, though, of risking getting in trouble for the sake of something that you are genuinely seeking, or something that you are wholeheartedly believe in, has a certain deserving element of respect to it, I think, that we, particularly given the history of Christianity and Lutheranism, should have cause to embrace. In doing so, though, we must look at the question, why? As anyone who has spent more than five continuous minutes in the presence of anyone under the age of four can attest to, 
humans have a seemingly natural instinct to ask why. Why are things the way they are? Why are you doing that? Why do I have to do this? As we get older into adolescence and have a seemingly deeper and wider understanding of the world around us, the answer often springs forth, I know, or rather, I know! <laughs> Transitioning into adulthood, I think we come to acknowledge that maybe the world isn't exactly what we thought it once was. And there is an accepted loss of innocence that we justify as moving past naivety. And although new sets of questions may still pop up, they are generally not as frequent or as insistent as they used to be. But perhaps they should be. When we stop asking why, I think it may be an indicator that we have begun to just simply accept what we know and how things are. And this is an all too fertile ground for growing complacency and a journey that has perhaps plateaued. I'll admit that as I have aged, part of my zeal for questioning and longing for hypothetical idealism has faded somewhat since my youth. And this is often because I'm just too tired or too busy to think about anything longer for than just a few minutes. Enter Nicodemus and Jesus. Rather than begin this late-night gab fest with a question, Nicodemus actually begins with a statement of belief, and a beautifully radical one at that, coming from a Pharisee. He asserts that Jesus must come from God, for no one could perform the signs he is doing if God were not with him. Before going any further, and most likely perceiving the inevitable line of questioning soon to come from Nicodemus, Jesus stops him right there and announces that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The original Greek here is, says anathen, um, and it actually has more than one possible translation, one being born again, or the other being born from above. But either way, Nicodemus being, uh, again, a pragmatic man of the law, sees this as an absolutely preposterous notion and tries to call Jesus on it. Jesus, though, being an ever-patient Messiah, tries to explain life not in terms of the body, but in terms of ruach. It's one of my favorite Hebrew words. It simultaneously means the wind and the breath and the spirit. Again, Nicodemus has this sense of incredulity and is like, what are you talking about? In a very Jesus sort of comeback, though, Jesus questions how Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel and doesn't get it. Jesus continues by saying that he's tried talking about facts, about things that we know, that we see on earth and how they work, and already the Pharisees don't believe. So, of course, it's not going to make sense if he tries to explain anything about heaven and the world that we can't see. But Jesus tries to put it all together neatly for Nicodemus anyway, though. And that is how we arrive at John 3, 16. The text doesn't explain how the evening ended, or if they talked any more, if they had any warm beverages. Nicodemus only shows up two more times in John's Gospel. First, when some other Pharisees are upset that some guards didn't automatically bring Jesus in to them for judgment when they had a chance. At which point Nicodemus, still serving on the council, steps in and questions their own authority to condemn someone for what they've done without at first at least asking the question, why? The second time is after Jesus' death. Joseph of Arimathea has asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus comes to his aid and wrapping the body in linen and adorning it with spices, this being the custom of Jewish burial rites. I'm not certain whether or not Nicodemus ever became a full convert, so to speak, and these two further references in the Gospel would indicate that he was not quite completely ready to give up on the world that he knew for the world that he could not understand. But it would also indicate that something stuck with him, enough to challenge his perceptions and publicly risk his life if there was a chance that he could somehow be born again from above. My brothers and sisters, you are about to hear a tremendous perspective on life's journey from our new speaker. That comes, I suspect, with a grand mixture of faith and doubt, and I suspect that this is a position that many of you may be able to identify with, but I believe doubt to be a necessary counterbalance to faith. If you are feeling completely comfortable with where you are in your faith journey today, the part of me that is tired and overwhelmed with life is extremely jealous. But I'll also admit that I would love to know why. C.S. Lewis has a great quote that states, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. I think that we as Christians know that there is a lot about our beliefs that we aren't necessarily able to fully explain or understand or even easily fully accept. 
And I know that there are quite a few of us here today that have a long list of questions to ask God when we get to heaven. But therein lies the beauty of the lesson that we get from Nicodemus. We won't necessarily get or understand all the answers, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop asking questions. As someone who spends a great deal of time around rampantly questioning four-year-olds, I try to offer up answers as much as possible, but I will admit that there are times where I run out of responses and inevitably end up with, because. <clears throat> now, I think as much as possible there are times on a certain level that that's all we need, and that's all we actually get. But I'm also certain that as someone who has been told, because, many times in his life, it's not always good enough. Like Nicodemus, we may have been set in our ways for years before coming to the place where we're at tonight. But through Jesus, we are continually confronted with something new, something radical, and something mysterious that entreats us to go out into the dark, despite the risks, come what may, to find our light again. Uh, my name is Laura Hamphy. I've been a member of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church since I was two years old. Um, my mother, my sister Annie, my <coughs> aunt, my uncle, and my little cousins Christina and Carolyn are also all members of Prince of Peace. Um, while at Prince of Peace, I've participated in Vacation Bible School um, as a child and as a crew leader, attended Sunday school, and sung the church's children and adult choir. In 2011, I served as a youth member on the church council um, board of representatives for, for a year. Um, I was really excited to have the opportunity to come and talk today, especially after hearing this week's readings. As Chris pointed out, John 3.16 is among our gospel today, and it's a verse from the Bible that, for me, has become central to my faith and how I view um, God. I mean, what better message is there than the message that God loved us enough to sacrifice His Son to save us and give us eternal life in heaven? However, this verse also has a personal meaning to me. Um, when my grandfather died when I was seven years old, this verse became especially important because it reassured me that my grandpa had gone to heaven. It reassured me that because my grandpa believed in God, and God loved him. He had gone to heaven when he died, and is watching over me and my family and playing baseball with the angels. I gained peace of mind after his death, knowing that in addition to him being happy and safe in heaven, I would be able to see him again in heaven when I eventually died. This message of love that I needed so much when going through my grandpa's death has become a central part of my faith that I've held on to throughout my entire life. However, the message of love and salvation that I held on to after my grandpa's death also worried me. I had the assurance that those who believed in God would go to heaven. But what about those who did not, or those who had never had the opportunity to learn about God? I became concerned about what would happen to my birth parents in China, because I had no way of knowing if they believed in God, much less if they had even had the opportunity to learn about God. I had no way of ensuring that in some way or somehow they would receive God's message of love and be able to go to heaven. Here, the following verse, John 3.17, helped me because it added to God's me message of forgiveness and mercy um, to his message of love and salvation. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The idea that God sent his son into the world in order to save everyone to give everyone a chance at heaven, and not create, not create this uncrossable boundary between those who would be saved and those who would not, reassured me that I did not have to continue to worry that I was not able to share my message of God's love to my birth parents. Since God was willing to send his own son into the world to tell everyone about God, I knew that God, some way and somehow, would find a way for my birth parents to have the opportunity to experience and know his love. And go to heaven. I knew that God loved me enough that I did not have to worry about this anymore. Now, during this same time, a lot of things happened when I was seven years old, um, I was also coming to terms with what it meant to be adopted. And there were times in my life when I felt so out of place in the world, and I wondered why God had put me on this path that was so unlike many other people's. I loved my mom, my grandpa, my aunt, my uncle, and my cousins, and they offered me more love and support than I could really ever imagine or know what to do with. But at the same time, I struggled with why God would take me away from my birth parents, why he would place me halfway across the world from where 
I should have been and where I sometimes felt like I should still be. Um, it was during this time of struggle in my life that my mom introduced me to the stories of Esther and Joseph, two people who also struggled with their place in the world, but whom God was able to do amazing things through. Um, you know, Joseph had been taken from his home where his father loved and favored him, and he became enslaved in Egypt, and furthermore, he was placed in prison for years and years for a crime he didn't commit. Um, Esther had also been taken away from her family and eventually was married to King Xerxes of Persia, someone who was not Jewish, did not follow her traditions or beliefs, and essentially cut her off from her own faith community. I could see in both of these toys that Esther and Joseph had their doubts, that they too questioned and asked God why their lives had turned out so unlike they had originally intended, and so unlike how they originally envisioned God to have their life go. But I also saw that God had a plan for each of them, that he didn't forget about Joseph sitting in prison in Egypt or Esther sitting in the palace in Persia. Um, he was able to take their situations and work through them to do amazing things. Joseph was able to save all Egypt and his family from famine because God put him in the position where the Pharaoh would one day come to him and ask him to interpret a dream he had, which would in turn warn the Egyptians about a coming famine. Esther was able to save her entire people from slaughter because she, God put her in the position to warn the king of Haman's plan to wipe out all the Jews in Persia. And he gave her a position of the, to have enough political power for her opinion to matter. Um, these toys reassured me that God also had a plan for me. They had not forgotten about me, had not let a mistake happen, and that I was where I was for a reason. Um, and this story has also told me that in addition to myself, God has a plan for not only me, but for everyone. And this is another belief that has really been true throughout my faith journey. Now, I've talked a lot about my family and the environment that they have created for me to grow in my faith, but I now would like to talk about my community here at Prince of Peace. I've been a member of Prince of Peace for 16 years since I was 2 years old and have pretty much grown up here. I've participated in Sunday school, vacation Bible school, Halloween parties, Christmas pageants, and choir here. And through these activities, my faith has grown in many ways. A little while ago, I asked my mom, why did we decide to come to this church? Of all the churches in Montgomery County and the area, why Prince of Peace? And she replied that, you know, first of all, Prince of Peace was a good Lutheran church that expressed our core beliefs as Lutherans. But she also said that when she had visited, the community had welcomed her. They had come up to her. They talked to her, a young mother with a small child. They talked to my grandpa, who was you know, old and in a wheelchair. And they talked to me. <coughs> um, plus, the cookie brigade came by our house and watched cookies later. <laughs> um, I particularly remember that memory. Um, the community at Prince of Peace felt welcoming. Now, I was able to experience this welcoming community firsthand when my cousins Christina and Carolyn were adopted, when my sister Annie was adopted. When we brought them over from China, we were so happy to welcome a new member into our family. And at the same time, Prince of Peace was so happy to welcome a new member into theirs. They really opened up their arms and welcomed all of my cousin and my sisters. And I could especially see this in Annie because she was older. She wasn't adopted when she was a baby. She was adopted when she was seven. And I knew that before adopting her, my mom prayed so many times that Annie would be able to form a strong connection with God because there was no guarantee that this would happen. Though she hadn't had the opportunity to learn about God in China. Um, sometimes I think she prayed about God forming a connection with, and Annie forming a connection with God even more than she prayed about Annie learning English. Um, so putting that in perspective. Um, the day in August, less than a year after Annie was adopted, when Annie came up to mom and she asked, when can I be baptized? When can I become a member of this community with God? It was one of the most important and blessed moments in my mom's life and in my own because we could see this connection that we had prayed so long for God and form with Annie and for Annie to form with God coming into fruition and happening before our very eyes. Um, I could also see God acting through the Prince of Peace community to help her journey by welcoming her, reaching out to her, and making her really a part of the church. 
and the welcoming and support of the Prince of Peace community when Annie was adopted has, I've seen many ways, played a key role in her faith journey. She's, I think, one of the most devoted people. She loves God so much, and it's quite an inspiration to me as well. And so by an extension, Prince of Peace playing a role in her faith journey has played an immense role in my own faith journey. Um, additionally, the church community works to foster students, and everyone in the community waits for them to personally connect with their faith. For me, the church helped me find music. I've always loved to sing and dance, and over the years, Prince of Peace has helped me to use these loves to praise God. Music is a way that I feel like I can personally connect to God. It is a way that I can worship Him, talk to Him, feel His presence in my life, and share His message with others. My family has been Lutheran for generations. Seriously, we've been able to track it back to before my great-grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> But music has given me a special way to praise God that is all my own. And Prince of Peace has encouraged me to continue to grow and continue to develop this connection with God through music. When I was younger, I had the opportunity to sing in the children's choir for many years, and I now have had the opportunity to sing in the adult choir. I have sung in numerous Christmas pageants, as an angel or the wise man, a shepherd, I think, something uh, along those lines, and have now been given the opportunity to sing psalms and other songs during worship. A couple of years ago, Pastor Sarah, our former assistant pastor, asked Megan Bruning and myself if we would be going to do a liturgical dance at the, at the ELCA Synod Assembly. This experience drew me even closer to God because I was able to praise him through my love of dance. Dance is something I've loved to do ever since I can remember walking. And for me to have the opportunity to praise God and to share my love of God with others through dance was something that I never imagined being able to do before. It's something that brought me so much closer to God and really strengthened my faith. Um, Prince of Peace has given me innumerable opportunities to praise God through music and create a special connection with God and share God's love and His message with others. Um, Prince of Peace has been my home for over 16 years. It's and it's been a place where I've been able to grow and learn about my faith. Second to my family, I see the Holy Spirit acting through Prince of Peace. Over the years, this church community has offered me the love, support, guidance, and community that I need to grow in my faith and my beliefs, and have the confidence to go out into the world and share my faith with others. Um, during high school, I have had the unique opportunity to be able to talk about my faith with my fellow students, most of whom are not Christian, many of whom are Jewish. Um, <laughs> These talks have strengthened my faith because it has given me an opportunity to not only talk about my faith with others, but to talk about why I believe in God and what my beliefs mean to me and how I live my life. And I can talk with my friends about the differences between their religions and my own, but I can also talk to them about the similarities. During one of my talks, I found that one of my friends who is Jew Jewish also had a strong connection to the story of Esther and Joseph. She actually used Joseph for her Torah portion at her bat mitzvah. Um, in addition to the fact that Joseph was turned into a Broadway musical and Esther was turned into an excellent VeggieTales episode that we pretty much grew up watching on loop, um, we both saw the same message in the stories. We saw that God had a plan for Esther. He had a plan for Joseph. He didn't forget about them, and therefore he wasn't going to forget about us. And finding this connection with my friend through the story that I had cherished over the years really made my faith stronger and helped me form even greater connections to my own faith. My mom has always told me that studying other religions helps to, you to learn about your own because it helps you know why you believe what you believe. And having the opportunity in high school to talk openly about my faith with my friends has certainly helped me cement my, cement my own beliefs. And it's even caused me to dig deeper in my faith and address some questions that I wouldn't have been able to answer on my own or I wouldn't have even addressed on my own. However, high school can also be an extremely stressful and challenging time for young people. Um, especially in the past two years of senior and a junior when college and college applications raise questions about the future such as college, debt, your major, essentially what you're going to do with the rest of your life. People often find themselves lost and questioning their place in the world as it progresses, sometimes in a way that feels like it's progressing without them. Um, the immense pressure at times becomes hard to bear, and a couple of my friends have had a particularly difficult time handling the pressure. 
I pray for them because I know how difficult it is to feel like you have no assurance or guarantee of anything in, life, in your life. To not know what you're going to do tomorrow, what you're going to do five years from now, 20 years from now, and how your life is going to turn out. But I know that God has given me a sense of assurance. He has placed before me a family and a community that has loved me, supported me, and taught me. They have assured me that God loves me, that he has a plan for me, and that his grace is enough. Thank you. So, where to start? That was the first thought that went through my head when I thought I, when I first heard I might be giving part of the sermon today, largely because, well, I had no idea what to talk about. Then Chris called me up and told me to just talk about my faith journey. Okay, that gives a, me a reasonable place to start with the concept of what a faith journey is. So, what is a faith journey? It's certainly not something I spend my time thinking about. I think about homework, social pressures, even sometimes philosophical questions like the meaning of life. But I don't really spend my time thinking about faith journeys. So I decided to do exactly what I've been told to so many times and ask God for help. Now, these days there isn't usually a voice coming down from above telling me the answers. So, that wouldn't work very well. But there is a voice of sorts in Scripture. So I looked up the Gospel reading for this week to see if it would help any. Oh, great. It's just Jesus chewing out one of the Pharisees for <laughs> not understanding him again. Actually, it's a bit more than that, but that's what my first thought was. So, how is that supposed to help? It doesn't really. But, then again, maybe I don't need to understand completely. I have some ideas as to what a faith journey might be, so I'll explore some list of events in my life that might qualify as my faith journey and see if any of those make sense. The first definition that comes to mind is the set of actions in which I have learned about God's love and deepened my faith in Him. That could go all the way back to when I first started coming to Pop in fourth grade, but I don't really remember that far back. <laughs> so, I'll start a bit later. Namely, I'll focus on what I've done in high school, since that's what I can remember well. Well, there's work camp. <laughs> I've gone three times, and every time it was quite the experience. And as for part of why, I'll reference the faith statement that I wrote when I went through confirmation here, where I made a reference to the book of James, where it is written that faith without works is dead. Well, spending several hours a day, every day, doing volunteer work with my crew was a rather simple way to put my faith into works, a very effective one too, and one that I don't think I'll ever forget. Every year work camp focused on another, another message from the Bible, and every year I feel like I left with my faith stronger than when I went in. On a more common basis, work camp only happens once a year, but more commonly, um, for most of high school, I have attended the youth group here on a weekly basis. I remember many things about these meetings. I remember theological discussions. One that stands out came out of a game that we were playing, where the question was asked about how Jesus, who came in an unexpected guise designed, designed to shock everyone, could take one form that could be considered universally unexpected by our global community. I remember awareness and volunteer events like the 30-hour famine and trips to Gaithersburg Help. I remember connections being made between my faith and the world outside of church. One surprising instance came when we were discussing the role free will had in theology and its impact on our lives, when there was even an analogy made between free will and several concepts in mathematics that can be approached but never fully obtained. Apparently, 
Theology can be related to math. I even remember going on nature hikes and backpacking trips, growing in my faith through appreciation of the wonderful natural world that God has made. I won't belabor any more details than that, and that covers the general areas in which I have been actively involved in my faith. So, let's move on to another possible definition. The next definition I can think of could be all the events where I have been aware of seeing God's presence in my life. This could potentially be an extensive story, but in the interest of time, I'll keep it brief. I shall start again with the beginning of high school, right after a rather depressing period of my life had started. I had just received a medical diagnosis that I was trying to who sorts out, and for the next three to four years I would end up going on and off of different medications trying to manage it, all the while watching as other family and friends received one medical diagnosis after another that they were having to deal with at the same time. Thus, most of how I can remember seeing God acting in my life during this time was in the form of the people that were in my life, and the way that I saw him acting through them, and how they helped me through that trial period. I liken the people around me during this time to the strong arms of God in a poem that I've read several times. The poem is called Footprints. It's about a dream that a man had, where he looked back along the journey of his life as he was walking along the beach and saw that several times, namely the lowest points in his life, there was only one set of footprints, whereas elsewhere there were two, his and God's. And when he asked the Lord about this, God said that it was during those times, when there was only one set of footprints, that God had carried him. Well, let me now tell you about some of the people who helped to carry me through my low times of life. First, there were the members of the youth group here the first group to really start supporting me when I was having trouble. They were always willing to let me join in when I wanted and stand on the sidelines when I couldn't handle it anymore. And the fact that they were there to support me, I consider a blessing. On several occasions, I dutifully showed up for youth group that week, but was feeling too stressed out to really participate because of everything that had been going on. And everyone was fine with me just standing in the corner of the room and listening to the discussion. I found a similar, similarly supportive group in the theater club at my high school, although I was not as well known there. A couple years later, I met the girl who would later become my best friend. At that time, I had dropped out of what I had, most of what I had previously been involved in, in order to deal with life, including, unfortunately, the school theater club, and had lost contact with all of my old friends. She was the first one in my new circle of friends, and she gave me the strength to start getting my life back in order. I distinctly remember the year that I met her, on my birthday, she walked up to me in between classes and just gave me a hug and a present and said happy birthday. That was actually rather unexpected at the time, and helped to restore my belief that there were still people around me, aside from my parents, who actually cared about me. I know that calling her an angel on earth would be presumptuous, so I won't, but if that's not a sign of God's love and care being shown through one of the people in my life, then I don't know what is. There are, of course, many more, but as I stated, I intend to be brief. Well, it could be that either of those stories that I just told you make up my faith journey, or that it is a third story that I haven't taken the time to go over today. The bottom line is, I don't know. I know where I am now, and where I'm trying to go, but I don't really understand how to get there. I was going to end there, but then it hit me. That was the connection. Nicodemus didn't understand either. He knew where he was at the moment, 
and he knew about the goals of his religion at the time, but he didn't understand how to get from one point to another. He didn't understand how the journey worked. And look at what Jesus told him, that to complete the journey, he had to be born of the Spirit. Perhaps that's not the way to complete the journey, but the way to start it. A faith journey is not a specific set of actions or events. It is our journey through faith, our journey through life while in faith. Every step we take, every event of our lives that occurs while we are in a relationship with God through our faith. After all, look at what happens during a journey. With every new step, we learn and grow new experiences that help us grow. Just as every day we grow in our living relationship with God that he has promised all of us, our life journey, taken while we have this faith, this connection, is our faith journey. That being the case, I have only shared a small portion of my faith journey with you. I could share more, but I don't want to go on all day. So I shall conclude with the hope inherent in this definition, that even when I leave to go back to school tomorrow, when all of us leave this service and go back to our daily lives, we will still be on our respective faith journeys, that we will continue to learn and grow in this wonderful relationship with God, even when we're not thinking about it, and even if we don't fully understand how the journey works. Amen. Thank you.